In April of 2020, as the COVID-19 pandemic first swept the globe, we saw a wave of ads and emails and commercials from just about every corporation containing some kind of a message regarding the pandemic. A popular video went viral on YouTube that spliced many of these commercials together, making it very clear that these ads are all drawn from the same playbook. In fact, most of the ads are identical in their delivery, regardless of the company deploying the ad. So what we're going to do here is use a compilation of commercials as a springboard for our rhetorical analysis. Beyond just acknowledging that these are similar commercials, right, that there are similarities across each of them, we're going to use our understanding of argument and of rhetoric, of rhetorical analysis, to better understand why they are so similar. What are the intended effects of each commercial or rhetorical device? And whether those ads are actually effective from a rhetorical standpoint. If you aren't familiar with the composition of an argument or with rhetorical analysis, here is a super quick and easy way to think about it. Just about every message has a speaker, a person who is writing it or delivering it or crafting it. It has a source, right, a speaker, and it also has an intended audience, a person, a set of people, uh, someone that is receiving the argument. And those three points, the speaker, the audience, and the message are the essential building blocks of any argument that's being crafted and delivered. Whether it's a sales pitch, a love letter, a commercial, branding a company as trustworthy, a plea to a parent, it could be anything. These are all arguments. The relationship between the speaker, the target audience, and message are key in achieving an argument's purpose. We often do comparative analyses between similar arguments and we dwell on the nuanced differences between them. So for example, what happens when two different car companies try to sell cars, same kind of speaker, same kind of audience, etc. But one company is a luxury leisure brand with a $100,000 price point, whereas the other is more economic at a $12,000 price point. Well, the audiences shift dramatically and oftentimes so does the language that's used, the kind of commercial, the visual rhetoric, the kind of voiceover, all to make the argument more effective and more impactful for whoever it's targeting. Even the way I said the word luxury leisure brand, that's rhetoric, right? Instead of saying high end or more expensive or wastefully expensive, the words matter. What's interesting about this particular analysis is that each of these commercials looks very, very similar. The speakers are consistent in that they're large companies. Their audiences are very similar and consistent in that they are national or global, very wide audiences, almost the general public. And the messages are very similar too, as we'll see in a moment. Claims for trust, being in it all together, etc. The occasion is the same. It's the onset of a global pandemic and a world of uncertainty. And their purpose? Well, it's likely to protect their assets and their brands by ensuring that their customers, their clients, their target markets, uh, they can all continue to rely on them in the face of this pandemic, right? In the face of these pandemic conditions. The purpose is basically to say, hey, even though the world is turning upside down with lockdowns and all of this other pandemic related craziness, you can still continue to rely on us, on our company. You can continue to trust our brand. Keep giving us your money and we'll continue to serve your needs. Now, with all of that on the table, it's interesting to see what these commercials look like because the fact of the matter is, they look incredibly similar. It's very rare to see such a confluence of factors for all of these huge companies. And it's really stunning to see that they are all making the same rhetorical plays at the same time. Now, it's surprising and yet it's not surprising because it makes perfect sense. So here's an obligatory thank you to the YouTuber Microsoft Sam for posting the original compilation of these commercials together, all spliced and threaded together in April. And that said, let's go ahead and jump into our analysis here.
So these commercials, these arguments, they consistently open with something that can be described as somber piano music. Uh, the fact that it's piano matters a little bit less than the fact that it's this slow tempo. It signals sadness or trouble or despair. In any kind of a speech or a book, the speaker has little choice but to use words that create that kind of a somber mood or tone. There's no other way to do it other than with language. But the beauty of a video ad or commercial is that music can be used to instantly set the tone for the target audience. There are no words necessary. There is no time wasted. It happens immediately. Music is used to signal, hey, here is a serious message about these troubling times that we're in. This is an appeal to pathos, basically meaning that it appeals to the audience's emotions. It's impossible not to listen to that kind of sad and somber music and to not feel sad and somber. That's human nature. And it's being used here to effectively craft this kind of impactful argument. It's also worth noting that some of the commercials also show images of human faces, uh, empty and familiar places, and messages of hope, like, we'll all get through this together. All of this serves to set the stage, to make explicit the kairos, or the occasion, of the argument that's going to follow. And this makes it very clear that this isn't just a Super Bowl halftime commercial, or some other ordinary commercial in, in life as we know it, in business as usual, but rather this is custom fit to the pandemic of April 2020. What comes next is all about ethos, or establishing credibility. Take a look before we unpack it. When we first opened our doors. Since 1926. Since 1978. For 60 years. For 75 years. For over 80 years. In 90 years. For over 100 years. So this is a one-two punch for quickly developing ethos or credibility, right? And putting that ethos to work. So the first punch, the one of that one-two combo, is in laying out how long the company has been in business. Some of them say for 80 years. Others that haven't been around long enough to draw credibility from some kind of a large number like that, they draw from similar phrases that accomplish the same thing, like, since the beginning. That's the setup, right? And the part two of that one-two punch is leaning into the company's reputation as the good guys. Nationwide has been on your side. Restaurants have always been there for you. Nissan has been with you through thick and thin. We will do what we've always done. So whether or not that reputation actually exists, as long as they pretend and say that it does, for the sake of the argument, it does. It builds ethos, it builds credibility. This takes the form of phrases like, we have always been there for you. So this is how the argument takes shape in a matter of seconds. Somber music sets the tone, snapshots of empty stadiums, and the phrase, we've been here for a hundred years, and in those hundred years, we have always been there for you. We could probably stop this analysis now, and the gist of these arguments in terms of what they're trying to accomplish would already be captured, but let's keep going and see what other kind of rhetorical maneuvers these commercials draw upon and share. Take care of people. We're people. 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 And family. 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 This is a wonderful exemplification of what a huge company does when it's trying to cater to a huge and global audience that's practically akin to the general public. Words like people, they're broad strokes. They make it easy for anyone who's listening to feel included. The word family is similar in that it's a pretty universal value. Regardless of what you consider family to mean, and that surely varies from person to person, the thing that holds true is that the idea of family is fairly ubiquitously positive. The rhetorical move here is to align the company or brand with family. They take care of families. They value families. They're practically part of your family. It's all in line with the purpose of this COVID era branding and what it's striving to accomplish. Even now. Especially now. Especially now. Right now. Now more than ever. More than ever. Today more than ever. Today more than ever. The next shift here continues to harp on Kairos, which is the occasion of the argument, the context in which it's taking place. Uh, and it uses it to emphasize the importance of timing. It creates a sense of urgency. So the argument is, in short, not only have I been here for you since the beginning, so much so that we're practically family, our relationship is more important now than it ever was before. And that sentence is powerful on its own. 
right? It's it's very interesting to think that this is exactly the message being delivered here. It sounds like something uh, a spouse or close friend or lover or family member might say. We've been together for so long and our relationship is more important now than ever before. And yet that's being said to you or that large target audience by a company, by a brand. In times like this, at times like these, during these difficult times, in these troubled times, challenging times, trying times, in these times of uncertainty, during this time of great uncertainty, during these uncertain times, during these uncertain times, in uncertain times, in uncertain times, uncertain times, unprecedented times, unprecedented times, unprecedented times. Again, we see more language that emphasizes the occasion, but this is also a great opportunity for us to talk about a rhetorical strategy that's pretty popular in sales. And that strategy is, basically, if the speaker can define a problem for a customer with great accuracy, or if a speaker can talk about any problem or issue with great accuracy, they are considered an authority on that issue, right? Uh, and if, if they can do it with greater accuracy than the customer can describe it, that speaker will instantly foster trust and therefore will be able to sell the customer on a solution. What we're seeing here is very much aligned with that strategy. It's an unpacking of the problem, that times are uncertain and unprecedented and challenging because everyone has the same problem. And as a result, we're seeing every corporation describing that problem in the same terms. It's this unprecedented moment in our history. It's time of social distancing. While things have slowed down. As we turn more inside. While the doors may be closed. While the distance between us has gotten bigger. The more we stay apart, we still find ways to stay close, even when we're apart. Now, part of that rhetorical strategy that we just discussed, the identification of a problem, is really delving into the details of that problem. It's emphasizing what the most painful or problematic points of that problem are. And here, the language moves to focus on how everyone is apart right? The consequences of social distancing. And we already know it's in preparation to sell some kind of solution. Even if we can't stand closer than six feet. We can all stay connected to work, school, and most importantly, to each other. There's still ways to touch each other. So what's the solution? Well, the problem is a pandemic. And while the purpose of the argument is to build and sustain brand trust, Yes, it's also to sustain sales. So the solution to pandemic-directed social distancing and physical store closures looks exactly the same across all companies and businesses and organizations. It's about bringing their product or their services home. All without leaving the comfort and safety of your home. Without leaving the safety of your home. From home. Home. Your home. At home. 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 That's the key. Groceries without going to the grocery store, right to your home. Buying a car without visiting a dealership, the car comes right to your home. School from home. Work from home. Everything from home. The solution, home, is as ubiquitous as the problem. Buick and GMC are here to help. Con Edison is here to help. Here to help. Our teams are here. We are here. We're here. We're here. Here for you. Here for you. We're here for you. We're here for you. We are here for you. We're here for you. We are here for you. We'll be here for you. Runnings is here for you. We're still here for you. We're with you. We're part of your community. So you can trust us. You can count on us. And we'll get through this. The core message, which reveals a big part of these arguments' purposes, is very straightforward. We're here for you. You may have lost your job. You may have lost a loved one. You might be isolated at home, unable to leave your house, unsure how you'll get food on your table, unsure how you'll cope with all that is going on. But rest assured, we, whoever we are, Target, Verizon, enter company or brand name here, we are here for you. The rhetoric is very strong, and it does a good job of finding a way in, especially in those most vulnerable areas. Some go as far as to explicitly demand trust. So you can trust us. Again, it's all part of that same core purpose. And there's another word that we can expect as these speakers try to unify themselves with their audiences. And that word is... Together. 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 Together.
Together. Together. Together. What's interesting about this is, yes, it does unify the speaker and the audience, and yes, it positions togetherness as a part of the solution being offered, a tempting alternative to isolation or aloneness or social distance, right? Uh, but the other thing that's interesting is that it also implies a symbiotic relationship where both the speaker and the audience are dependent on each other. Uh, and this is the case, right? Uh, Target can say that they're here for you, but the truth is you are in it together because if you don't use their roadside pickup or delivery services or order online, uh, their well-being, their future is just as vulnerable, just as at stake as yours or anyone else's. In a sense, this togetherness is almost like a plea for customers to keep returning or spending as usual. A sort of, we'll keep up our end of the bargain, even if it means coming into your home and providing you with that solution, if you keep on spending. You're happy, we're happy. It's a deal that they're offering. When the music speeds up, that increase in tempo creates a rhetorical lift. Again, because these arguments are commercials, they're not entirely dependent on language alone. They can pair positive and happy images with upbeat music to immediately create a sense of optimism. The implication, without even saying a word, is that things are going to get better. Perhaps things are already getting better. And perhaps uh, that's because of the brand making the argument, right? Because they're the speaker. They've positioned themselves as the lift in the argument. It's also worth noting that many of these commercials also put frontline workers in the spotlight. Now, why do they do that? Aside from the fact that it seems like the morally right thing to do, maybe that's just our reaction as, as members of the audience in taking uh, the, the rhetoric, we've got to remember that this is a strategy. Everything is a strategy, right? Uh, they could have just as easily not included frontline workers, or included footage of police, or children, or protesters, or viral particles, or puppies, and instead they're showcasing frontline workers and they strive to make it seem like this whole argument about trust and togetherness isn't really about them, the companies. In other words, by paying homage to the folks still working at Dunkin' Donuts every single day, Dunkin' Donuts accomplished a few things. Number one, it suggests that this commercial isn't actually about the company Dunkin' Donuts or building brand awareness or customer trust, which isn't true. Uh, but showing frontline workers and thanking them is a device that makes it seem like you aren't actually selling your product. It's a tricky spot because no one wants to be sold to during a pandemic. No one wants a sales pitch. But these companies have little choice but to try to continue to sell, to ensure their survival, right? To stay in business. So this kind of rhetorical device enables them to sell without appearing slimy or greedy or egocentric. And the other benefits, well, it fosters some morale among those frontline workers, it makes us feel like that might be a great place to work, a great place to support, uh, somewhere that you or your co-workers or other workers are made to feel valued, considered heroes even. Uh, it's a solid strategy that effectively makes the argument about the audience through the use of collective pronouns by celebrating others like frontline workers, healthcare workers, and so on. <laughs> So what's with the applause? Well, it signals an unspoken agreement from the audience or viewership whether or not that agreement is actually there. So if you hear clapping, your brain assumes that there is widespread agreement and so perhaps it's more open to accepting that argument as agreeable. Uh, this can be considered the equivalent of adding a laugh track, which is something that has been used for decades as a device to make dialogue that is perhaps otherwise less funny or unfunny seem funny. And the device cues the brain to feel or react in a certain way. Uh, so to exemplify this, here's a short clip from Friends with the laugh track clipped out. Okay, ladies. And here's today's class. And let's remember, let's be safe out there. Great class. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah, I was watching. Hey, 
Okay, a couple of questions though. Um, you know about that that last move where that woman tripped you and then pinned you to the floor. What what what, what would you do next? <laughs> well, then she'd take her keys and try to jam no, them no, in no, you. No, 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 no. What would you do next? Oh, me the attacker? Yes, that's right. Why? I tried attacking two women. Did not work. It's okay. I mean, they're they're my friends. In fact, I I, I was married to one of them. You attacked your ex-wife? Oh, no, 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 <laughs> I tried. Maybe we could attack them together. That's crazy, right? And you can search YouTube for more videos without laugh tracks to enjoy more of those. It's a really interesting and powerful device. And that about does it for our analysis here. Uh, this is a unique moment in history where enormous segments of the global populace are experiencing the same kinds of problems. And the arguments, the rhetoric that is being created as a response to those problems and surrounding the entire pandemic is really worthy of analyzing further. If you haven't already done so, be sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel. And if you're a teacher, you're looking for great lessons to engage your students and to teach arguments, head over to teacharguments.com.